time up. Deep right field. Down the line it goes. Castellanos is out of room. It's out of Runner goes. 3 2 pitch hit down the line. Is it there? It is a fair ball into the corner. Off and running. Chew. Yu Chang around third. He's going to score easily. And in the second, hit hard. Hit deep. Up and out. Goes a man Rosario. And there's a fly ball. Left field. It's deep. It's up. It's gone to the port. All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome on in to another episode of the Guardians of the CLE podcast. I am here with me here. I have my co-host, James Elifritz. James, how are we doing? I am gassed up about this. The Guardiac kids right now. Can't be any but better. I mean, just to be a fan of a Cleveland team right now, you're, you're on cloud nine. Yeah. What a time to be alive for Cleveland sports fans. Like, I'm driving home from getting my hair cut today, and I'm just gassed up. You got Donovan Mitchell getting introduced as a Cleveland Cavalier today. He he might have had more people at the airport to meet him than we had in Progressive Field today, which is unreal. The Browns are 1-0, and looking for their first 2-0 and start since the Stone Age. And your Cleveland Guardians are a season high, 11 games over 500. They got a four-game lead on the White Sox, which... Technically, it's five in the loss column. Uh, the Rockies were able to beat Dylan Cease and the White Sox today on getaway day. Uh, so our magic number is 17 as Chicago heads into town um, for a makeup game tomorrow. And yeah, we what's crazy about this winning streak right now is this will be a nine-game winning streak, if not for the game that I just so happened to be in attendance for out in beautiful Kansas City, Missouri, last Wednesday night. James, what do we make of that? Well, we're we're just glad to have you back. Um, I really think it was nice of uh, Brandon Lewis to allow you to use the Believe Land Media private jet to go out and attend those games. Um, so, Brandon, um, I'd like to sign up for that list and uh, have that private jet available for playoff games. Yeah, I want to thank Kevin for filling in for me last week. You guys did a great job. Meanwhile, I was handling real business, and I was a row behind the Guardians' bullpen. Um, And let me tell you, that is a fun group of guys down there. And honestly, I did not know that my tweets about the bullpen that night were going to pick up as much steam as they did. Um, If you're not following me, at Mello underscore NIE 91. Um, But 99% of everything said in those tweets was factual. Um, everybody got a nice shock when Brian Shaw was warming up, um, late in that game, eighth going into the ninth right. inning, we got good old Brian Shaw surprise warming up. You had Eniel De Los Santos smashing Red Bulls and Nutri-Grain bars. So if anybody was wondering what their pregame meal is, in-game meal, it is Red Bull and Nutri-Grain bars. So anybody who can, you know, smash a can of Red Bull in the bullpen and jog on in, to the game is cool in my book. Sounds like a delicious snack and a great drink. So anything that keeps them up and motivated on a long season, I'm all for it. Yeah, and in all seriousness, Kauffman Stadium, gorgeous stadium. I had never been there before. Um, It was a grueling 11-hour drive to Kansas City, but it was well worth it to see the boys somewhere other than Progressive Field. I try to do that. Every summer, I'm going to start trying to do that more moving forward. But, you know, I had my fiance with me that night, and she is not a sports fan, but she got very emotionally invested in this game we were at out in Kansas City. Um, And she was absolutely shell-shocked when we lost that game in the ninth. I mean, she was deflated beyond belief. She told me she had to go back to the hotel and decompress. And I said, what did I just do here? Because this is the life of a Cleveland sports fan. I mean, I'm- you're in a you're in a stadium where it's got fountains. You think you could go over there and just kind of chill and listen to the water, right? Yeah, and, and I lost down. you think I lost the car, James. I lost our car. What? So she's freaking out about losing the game and I lost the car. Because anybody who's been to Kansas City, or if you haven't, I'm gonna kinda tell you very quickly. It's the Kansas City Chiefs Arrowhead and Kauffman yep. Stadium. Bam, Sorry. right there. 
and it's just got one ginormous parking lot about five times the size of Cedar Point. It's its own highway exit. That's how big it is. We get all the way up to the gate when we get there. And I'm like, shit, I didn't take a picture of where the car is. And I know in my mind, I should probably go back and get the picture. I didn't. The game ends. There's tons of people everywhere. We walk out, have no idea where the car is. And they have a golf cart that gives, you know, elderly people and anybody who needs a ride, a ride to their car. She slams on the brakes of the golf cart and goes, you guys must not be from here. Do you need a ride to your car? <laughs> yes, we need a ride to our car. Awesome. We drove, she drove us it. around in this golf cart for 15 minutes trying to find our car. And if it wasn't for my fiance's car, having Michael Myers, Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees and Chucky stickers on the back of it. I don't know that window. we ever. Yep. Yep. I don't know that we ever would have found it, but overall great trip. Class A is not going to be perfect. Um, we'll get into later of why he is the best reliever in baseball. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so much we can say about these guys right now. I mean, they've won six games in a row. And what's even crazier is we finished off that Seattle series at home. We had a two and eight week. Uh, Savali and Plesek going on the IL and it kind of just felt like, we, you know, this young team was starting to implode a little bit. But what do they do? They go eight and one in their last nine games. They've swept two straight series. They have six one run victories. They're averaging 4.6 runs a game. And, you know, six one run victories is what really stands out to me, James, because it's not often that you see such a young team able to keep their composure and just be so cool, calm and collected under pressure, you know, in order to pull those one run games out. Yeah, I was thinking about that today, just the way we were. It's almost, you know, you look back at the way you, they would say National League Baseball was played, where you're manufacturing runs, uh, except, you know, with the, the pitchers hitting gone, that's that's it's great to have that DH, um, even if you were in a National League park at the time. But just overall for the season, uh, it's, it's just great to know that we're manufacturing runs, finding a way um, – to, to get on base. And then I was watching today's highlights and seeing Jimenez score from first base on that shot down the left field line. Um, I was thinking that our lineup, if you think about our lineup, besides our catchers there, I don't think there's too many guys on the, on our uh, roster that can't score uh, from first base and a ball hit in the corner ball hit in the gaps. Um, I really think that I'd love to see what our percentage rate is for uh, you know, an extra base hit with a guy on first, how many times we score. I bet it's a very high percentage. Yeah, they're one of the best in the business, not only at stealing bases, but taking that extra base um, whenever they can. Um, and, you know, some of that speed we got down at the bottom of the order is a huge part as to why this offense has really started picking it up after kind of a silent week against Baltimore and Seattle. They're getting contributions from the bottom of that lineup. I mean, Miles Straw, a guy I have been insanely tough on on this podcast um, for good reason. He, you know, up to this point has put up one of the worst offensive seasons in MLB history. Uh, But over the last 11 games, he's hitting 317 and kind of a turning point for him seemed to be when Will Benson started those couple games out in center field against Baltimore. You know, it kind of really kicks her on to gear a little bit there. Yeah, when you get your starting uh, position challenged a little bit by a young and up and coming guy, um, yeah, it's gonna you're gonna spend a little more time in a batting cage um, and, and taking a few more swings every day just to try to get better. Because yeah, he was getting to the point where I was ready to write a letter to Major League Baseball asking, please let him use an aluminum bat because <laughs> I mean his <laughs> just awful, awful at batting average. But thankfully, he's got his glove. Yeah, he could have used any help that he could get over most of this season. Um, Tyler Freeman, too. A guy, you know, former number number one prospect, you know, has kind of flown through the ranks. Had a couple shoulder injuries down in the minors. They called him up, and, you know, he's not really getting those consistent at-bats. I've been screaming for him to get those consistent at-bats just simply because of the hit tools that he possesses. I mean, it's like having another Quan. If you could slide him into the number two hole, you know, this lineup would just take off. But the problem is 
there's not really anywhere to play him consistently every day. So, you know, he's bouncing back and forth, second, third. He played short today. Um, but in the games he does play, he makes the most of those opportunities. And it's really hard for kids to come up and not get consistent at bats and somehow find a rhythm. And we're starting to see that with Tyler Freeman. He's, you know, he's really embracing that role and taking on that challenge of, you know, I'm going to act like I'm starting whenever my number is called, I'm going to be ready to go. And it's showing in his numbers. He sits safely in seven out of eight games that he's played in September, which comes out to a 333 average. And I mean, in today's game, you know, he had two big hits, phenomenal over the shoulder catch um, in short left field. And dude's just a baller. He makes contact. And I, I personally get super pumped when Tyler Freeman does big things in this lineup. Yeah, and it just seems one of the greatest challenges and the, probably the credit that Terry does not get is getting guys in the lineup here and there. I don't know how many times I turn on a game and I just yeah. – it's like, oh, that's the starting lineup. I don't, you know, it almost looks like a JV squad, right? It, like, all right, but I understand it because he's got to play his guys off the bench. Um, usually young guys are – it's even that much more important. Um, but he's done an amazing job as far as – uh, just getting guys in throughout the, the season, even if it's just pinch hitting. Yeah. You know, just to, just so they're mentally prepared to get on that field um, when their name's called. Yeah. And another area that Tito and Carl Willis have been outstanding at this season is managing this pitching staff. Um, like I said, please heck and Savali both went on the injured list prior to that series opener against Seattle. Um, but you can't ask much more from Shane Bieber, Tristan, and Cal Quantrill. You know, they're doing their job as the three healthy veterans in this rotation. They're giving the team length in their starts. And it's really helped kind of easing the burden on that bullpen is, you know, Cody Morris is still getting stretched out as a starter. You know, he was working in a relief role down in Columbus coming off the injury. Um, you got Connor Pilkington, who just kind of grinds out four or five innings a start. Um but the bullpen as well, you know, we mentioned that bullpen getting gas. The bullpen has a 3.30 ERA during this stretch of games and hasn't allowed a run in the last 14.1 innings. By far the best bullpen in baseball since the all-star break. What do you make of this pitching staff as we sit right now, James? Um, just great support, you know, one hand, you know, feeding the other and, you know, your starters are getting your getting the innings they're supposed to get in there. Um, and the guys are, have it's accepted their roles, uh, whether it be Karen check. <laughs> in the touch the hair, inning. touch the hair. Oh, shoot. Yeah, I can't. You shoot. know, I can't. Yeah. My stylist, you know, I, they're, I they're unemployed. Uh, no <laughs> hair. But yeah, it's just, I mean, he drives me crazy on that mound. Just throwing the ball. Talking nonstop. to himself. Absolutely. Um, but hey, as long as he, he's throwing strikes and continues to get people out, um, I, I enjoy watching him play. Yeah. Speaking of James Karen check, this seems like a perfect leeway or segue, I mean, into the Friday series opener in Minnesota. Um, it was a game that was delayed by rain at the beginning. Um, I was out and about listening to 1100 and they were acting like there's no possible way we get this game in tonight. And then immediately after Andre tweets, First pitch, 820 Central Time. So I'm like, let's go. Let's play ball. Let's see what these Minnesota Twins, who were in second place at the time, let's see what they got. Let's see what they're bringing to the table. Um, the common theme in this series sweep at Minnesota was jumping out to early leads and just kind of clutching onto it for dear life. James, you know, they scored early. They scored often early. But then they just kind of did nothing the rest of the game, and they let the Twins back into it. Yeah, I know that, you know, Minnesota's had a, a lot of injuries, you know, Buxton being out, um, you know, he's been a solid player all-star oh, this year. Um, but, you know, they're, it's, the injuries are starting to show, and they just look like a team that was flat, yeah. um, defeated the whole series. It just seemed like there was nothing there. Yeah, flat's a really good word to describe the way they played. You could tell the fans were irritated. Rocco Baldelli is just in straight desperation mode at this point. And then you got Carlos Correa hitting in that two hole, who's kind of trying to just throw the whole team on his back and carry them into October. And, you know, it's just not looking like he's 
going to be able to do that by himself without getting contributions from the rest of their lineup. But, you know, Friday and Saturday are two of those games. You know, you had the big leads early and you had to burn class A in both of those big in both of those games. It kind of cost us big on Sunday. You know, he was unavailable. Um, at that point he had pitched in five out of six games today. He's pitched in five out of six games. So they're kind of trying to keep him fresh. But before class A entered the game Friday, we had Hairgate. We had Hairgate in the eighth inning, James Karen out on the mound. And, you know, once again, Rocco Baldelli is just might be one of the most annoying people associated with the game of baseball. I mean, to me, It seems like he is constantly whining about something. Um, Friday, it was James Karinczak. We all know James has probably came up with some sort of way to get a better grip on the ball, using the sweat in his hair with the rosin. Baseball says it's legal. He doesn't have to hide it. He can be as flamboyant with it as he wants to be. Um, Obviously, with as extra as he is with all his things that, you know, you're demonstrating here. He's kind of bringing it on. He's kind of bringing that attention onto him. I think Rocco Baldelli's, you know, sole purpose in doing that was to get in his head. Um, it was in the middle of an at bat to Luisa Rise, so I don't even know why they were able to do that. Um, but the umpire goes out, um, slides his fingers through James Karinchak's hair, who says he can't be romantic about baseball. Um, and it, you know, maybe it worked. Karinchak. Gave up a two-run bomb to Korea in that inning, which got the Twins even closer. Um, what are your thoughts on Hairgate? Well, I'll tell you what. There's not too many Karens out there that you want to get all pissed <laughs> off. That's for damn sure. Rocco um, is one. <laughs> yep. So, you know, the umpire's going out. There. I'm surprised. You know, he he was actually pretty uh, mild. You know, James Karachek was pretty mild about it. Um, he could have been a heck of a lot more upset. I know there's a lot of players. What, what happened? What was it? Uh, Madison Bumgardner. Remember that? Uh, was that last year or the beginning of this season where the umpire was like, he was trying to leave the field and they were trying to check him. And the, unf- the umpire was staring him in the face as he was like checking him down. And Bumgardner got all pissed off. And yeah, uh, that was, that was a little, yeah, that was a little bit uh, where that was a new rule a little bit, but still, I don't, with Bumgardner and the way he is. It wouldn't have mattered, I think, how long that rule had been in play. He didn't like, not like how that umpire interacted with him during the check. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what, if Karen Jack wouldn't have gave up that home run to Correa, if he would have got out of that inning clean, he probably would have launched himself to the moon. He would have been so fired up. That's the biggest disappointment is we didn't get to see James Karen Jack react to Rocco Baldelli if he got out of that inning clean. And we'll never know, but... I'll tell you what, my imagination has him sprinting around target field and just launching himself out of the stadium. Like that's (laughs) how fired up this dude gets. And he makes me nervous as hell sometimes, but I'll tell you what, he comes through. He has been one of the most effective relievers um, in this bullpen lately. But before we move on to Saturday, another kind of asshole thing Rocco Baldelli did was Austin had just made that catch. Um, where he kind of slid into the twins dugout. Yeah. They all kind of backed out of the way, didn't try to help him up or anything. And then Rocco challenges the call that he caught it. Like, dude, it happened right in front of your face. Like you literally watched him fall and didn't even attempt to help him up. There's no way. There's no way you didn't know that he caught that ball. Yeah, I'm surprised. I was thinking about that as I was watching that. So I'm surprised they don't have a gate. On that part of the dugout. Man. Yeah. You Scary know. moment for Hedgy, but luckily he was okay. He's a gamer per usual. There's not any ball that he's not going to try to get to. Um, we move on to Saturday. We're talking about that starter length again. Tristan gave us that length on Saturday. Uh, he got better as the game went on. That's kind of been a theme for T-Mac lately. He went seven innings, gave up no runs, only six hits, five strikeouts, two walks. And once again, they jumped out to an early lead Rosario hit the two run bomb Quan had four walks which fun stat here uh, Quan is only one of seven Cleveland rookies to do that in the last 100 years and he's the first since Kenny Lofton in 92 according to Zach Meisel and again the kid just gets on base like I call it just doing Quanny things yeah I mean he he lives on base I, I I'd never guess he was a rookie 
Never. And you know what? I had, I thought, I really thought there would be some fall off, you know, after April, but I'm just super impressed with how he has maintained consistently throughout the year. Um, just getting on base, hitting for average, making plays in the outfield. Uh, I, I don't think, did anybody expect that at all no. out of his triple A season last year? I knew I knew that he could hit at this level. I, I worried a little bit more about his defense. So that's kind of surprised me more. And it's kind of surprising me he hasn't hit more home runs yet. But I do think that power is going to come. And I do think he has the ability to hit, you know, 10, 15 bombs a year, which, I mean, that's huge. And we, yeah. we saw it in a game on Sunday. He's got it in there. And if it doesn't come, he does not get stronger. He can continue to play this game the rest yeah. of his career. And we'll always find a spot for him. And Major League Baseball in general yeah, would love to have players like Stephen Kwan. Yeah, and speaking of that outfield defense, Will Benson just completely robbed Max Kepler of a home run yes. in the eighth in- eighth inning. I mean, he should be in jail for armed robbery at this point. Like, he just committed a felony on that dude. And that's after Kepler got robbed by Andre Simenez on an insane, insane dive and catch in the fifth. James, I know you got some choice words I for love Max it. Kepler. I love it because when I was watching it, I can't tell you. Max Kepler is one of those guys where, and I don't know about you, but you, you turn on a game. And I swear, every time they play the Twins, and if I don't catch it from the beginning, I turn it on, here comes Max Kepler. And it's like (laughs) every time I watch him hit, he's getting a hit, home run, whatever. It's like I swear he bats 800 when I watch him. So there are times, literally, I do not want to watch him hit against Cleveland because I think it's me. Polanco, too. Polanco's another guy I can't stand. He's always doing something against us. (laughs) But I go back to when Paul Canerco played for the White Sox. He was that guy before Mex Kepler came. Yes, Every time I watched Dan Canerco against the Indians, he'd kick our ass. And I'm like, man, I need to just turn it off. I need to not watch him hit and then click it back on and watch the game. But I don't know about you. If you get yeah, you see certain players like that throughout the season, but Max Kepler's that guy for me. Yeah. Kepler, Kepler and Polanco are definitely those guys on the twins for me now. Um, but that catch by Benson, you know, we talked about how good Quan's defense is out and left. Should definitely win that gold glove. Um, but it had me thinking just how outstanding our outfield defense is this year. And last year, remember, they had one of the worst outfields in all of Major League Baseball last year. And they didn't, you know, they didn't sign anybody. They didn't trade for anybody. And most Guardians fans were panicking heading into the year what that outfield would look like. We know we started with Bobby Bradley and Oscar Mercado on the roster. They quickly shipped those guys out of town. You know, now we got two potential gold glove winners in Quan and Miles Straw. Benson off the bench to give you just elite defense in, in place of either one of those guys. And, you know, Cups up, bonehead. Sometimes, kind of- so yeah, uh, class A once again. Uh, in this one, Shaw was to blame, gave up three runs in the ninth. It was six to one to start the ninth. Shaw gave up three, made it six four. Uh, class A had to come in once again, get the save. Um, and if Shaw can't even handle mop up duty, I'm not really sure, um, what his role is on this team right now. And I, I definitely think he should be far, far away from any playoff roster. Um, we might have, and you know, very simply, the deep the differences in his velocity. 
when he's sitting 95, 96, he's really good. Um, but when he's at 91, 92, they just light him up. They're just hitting balls all over the place. And you just don't know who you're going to get on any given day. And, you know, because of that, you obviously, I don't think, can trust him in any type of leverage situations the rest of the way. Well, being our all-time appearance leader, um, and then, you know, we we need to, we need some uh, experience on, on the team. So I – Terry's going to stick with his guys, you know, even with his struggles, I think that experience uh, is going to pay dividends, especially, uh, you know, just, and you sat near the the dugout. So I'd be curious to see if you saw, you know, Shaw in any kind of verbal role where he's, you know, coaching up some of these guys out there, even though he's an active player, he's, he's closer to retirement than he is his prime. So. Yeah, you know, I just it, it has to be something where you have we don't have, and he party. does. I think he is more of a vocal, right. kind of a player coach at this point. Right, and we just you know we really don't have that party at Nappy's Napoli's mentality. <laughs> you know, having that experienced guy even on the in the dugout throughout the game um, that we need. Who do who do we who do we who is that? It's got to be Terry, right? Yeah. It's got. I mean, Jose. Has been here Rosario. a while too. They love Rosario in that clubhouse. But, but even you, would... I mean, you could bring somebody else with a, even that's been in the league for a lot longer. We just don't have that, you know, towards the end of their career type yeah. uh, veteran player in the dugout. We got it in the bullpen with Shaw, but um, I'm hoping that doesn't come back to bite us uh, in the playoffs. Right? So, did I just say playoffs? Point. Yeah, I did. It's manifest. Coming. We got to manifest it. Yep, it's coming. Um, before we move on to the Angels series that just wrapped up, just real quick Sunday, once again, got the dub in Minnesota, four to one. Um, Jose added a double after a Quan and Jimenez solo home run. Uh, but Jose hit a double in this game. It's significant because he became the first player in club history and the only player in Major League Baseball this season to have 25 plus home runs, 100 plus RBIs. 40 plus doubles and 15 plus steals this season. So, you know, while he's not been the Jose, he was the first couple months of the season, he's still putting up gaudy, gaudy numbers, um, which is really all we can ask for in the middle of that lineup. Yeah, he's our, he's our MVP for sure. And he will, I'm sure national media will not give him the votes that he deserves, but we know how important he is to our right. club and uh, just thankful that he signed that extension. Oh, for sure. Um, so Monday they came home, uh, Los Angeles angels shuffled up their rotation a bit threw three straight lefty starters at us. Obviously they don't know the numbers. We've struggled against those lefties on the year. Um, but we busted out for four in the second. It was good to see against a left-handed starter. Um, and I know you got some thoughts on Pilkington deciding to pitch to Mike Trout in the fifth. He ended up hitting a two run homer that I bet to tie the game at four. I mean, one of the hottest guys in baseball since he came off the DL. Straight at that point. And I know Homer. Otani's, yeah, I know Otani's behind him. But uh, you still think when 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 a guy's hit that many home runs in a row in, game, in games that you're going to try to pitch around a little bit. Maybe he did. Maybe he just missed his spot. And, uh, you know, Trout took advantage of it. Yeah. I mean, and, and Trout's known to kind of go out of the zone a little bit and just make things happen. Yeah. You know, he'll bloop some hits in. Obviously, this one left the yard, but dude's just on fire. Yeah, Trout's made a living of making pitchers look terrible. So. Yeah, when he's healthy, baseball is just better for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, game stayed tied at four, heading into the seventh. Again, Quan doing Quanny things. Looped a single to left off a tough lefty. Um, then he got the, the lightning bolt like a Mario Kart. Flew, flew around from first, scored on a Rosario double. Uh, put us ahead. Then bottom of the seventh, all the managers got ejected. Um, just the home plate umpire was just kind of goofy in this one. And unfortunately, um, he ended up getting hit in the face with a foul ball when there was one strike to go. He didn't ump the rest of the series. So we hope he's okay. Yeah. How do we lose two managers back to back without a pitch being thrown? And then the umpire gets knocked out of the game at the end, the one that threw him out. That was I, that was bizarre. I'd never bizarre. seen anything like that ever. But that's what you love about baseball, because when you tune in, you never know what you're going to see. 
you're going to see something different constantly. But yeah. I still <laughs> it blew my mind. And anybody watching on YouTube has to love Mel's background right now of Tito and the umpire just going at it. Video I mean, it evidence. F bombs nonstop. I mean, it was hilarious. I could not believe that. I, mean, I hope Terry went to the to see his doctor the next day because I ain't ever seen him that pissed off before. Yeah, I know. And they allegedly talked after the incident, so that's kind of funny. Yeah. Um, just real quick, Class A since 2021 among Major League Baseball relievers. He's first in ERA, first in opponents OPS, second in FIP, which kind of measures a pitcher's effectiveness taking defense out of the equation. Um, he's at a 2.06. It's on a 1-5 to five scale, so he's pretty much elite. Um, second in homers per nine, second in ground ball percentage, first in barrel percentage. So when people want to argue with you on who's the best reliever in the game, who's the best closer in the game, keep those stats handy because it is our guy, Emmanuel Classe. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday, last night, we won three to one. Kirk McCarty gets the game ball in this one, 3.1, just clutch innings, ice in his veins. Um, after Cody Morris only went two and two thirds, McCarty only allowed one hit in his three and a third innings and just kind of really saved the bullpen last night. Um, and it allowed Oscar Gonzalez to blast a two run homer in the fifth to put the guardians up three to one, which is how that one would end class A with the 35th save league leading. And that ball that he hit out low and inside. Yeah. How, how he, turned I don't know on how that, that got out. This is a guy that I, I wish he would watch some film on Manny Ramirez because if he can really learn that when, when the ball's outside, <laughs> excuse me, when the ball's outside, if he can start learning to hit the ball opposite field, look out. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's going to really tap into that power and he look out league. Um, because in his last nine, I believe nine games, um, he is on fire. 394 average, four doubles, four <laughs> home runs, and 11 RBIs. And what an impactful bat right behind Jose Ramirez in that lineup. And he actually added one in his first at-bat today, too, which was so cool. Hits the game winner last night in the fifth, comes back today, first at-bat, blasts it, left center into the bleachers. Um, Cal Gritty again gave us seven innings today. Like we mentioned earlier, Tyler Freeman came up big with those two hits. But Jose finally looked like Jose. And after swinging at a slider that I'm pretty sure hit him in the foot, he launched a two-run homer into the right field seats to put us up 5-3. to three. Karen Check came in for his third save to kind of give Class A the day off. Yeah, I'd love to see Jose, Jose start to, you know, stay warm, but then get hot right that last going into yeah. Kansas City because – we need some guys to be hot going into the playoffs. Got a feeling we clinched that division early that some of these guys probably get some rest, but I definitely want to make sure that these guys are in rhythm too. If you look back at the team that we had when we won 22 games in a row, yeah, which was impressive a few years ago, um, we got hot too fast and there was yep. too much time in between that win streak and the end of the season. And when, when we hit the uh, playoffs, we just – we weren't there. We yeah. weren't where we needed to be. And Cal Quantrill looks super comfortable right now. Can you tell just by looking at his face and his body language, the confidence that he looks like he has out on the mound? Yeah, he's locked in. He's yeah. locked in for sure. They're holding it down until uh, Savali can hopefully come back next week. He threw a bullpen. Um, if all goes well, he'll go out on a rehab start and could join the team next week, which would be another big addition to that rotation, provide some stability. Um, but looking at the week ahead, you know, we got nine straight versus Chicago and Minnesota. So buckle your seatbelts, everybody. Um, uh, check the batteries in your remote. Make sure you're ready to go if you're let's watching. scoreboard tomorrow. watch because this, this is going to be big coming up here. You mentioned they could clinch the division early. I kind of have that same sentiment as well. Um, with this four-game lead, five in the loss column right now, really over this nine-game stretch, they really only need to go like four and five, um, and they're they're still okay. So I hope these guys continue to play cool, calm, collected, loose. The ball's in their court. 
you know, they control their own destiny here. Um, we got Chicago coming in tomorrow for the makeup game. Chicago's throwing Lance Lynn at us. He dominated us last time we faced him. We got Hunter Gaddis coming up. Um, he wanted to give Tito wanted to give Tristan an extra day of rest. Um, so everybody's going to face the twins. Obviously it's a five game series this weekend. Um, but Tito said post game, it'll be Tristan Friday, Bieber and Pilkington on Saturday for the doubleheader. Cody Morris going on Sunday. He'll be a little more stretched out, hopefully 80, 85 pitches for him. Um, yeah. and then Cal will finish that series off on Monday. Yeah. I'd like to see Cody get past the fifth inning. You know, that would, yeah, he got to, he got to limit those walks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Andre not reported during the broadcast today that Minnesota thinks that they will have Jorge Polanco back for this five game series. Um, they said Buxton isn't far behind them. They're going to travel with the team to Cleveland and try and get in there. That's to be expected. I mean, this is Minnesota's season. You know, a lot of people are, are including their own fans are calling them dead in the water. Um, so they really got to bring everything they got this weekend against us. Um, but so after this five game series, uh, we go to Chicago and Texas before coming home to finish up the year with Tampa Bay and then six against KC while Minnesota and Chicago duke it out. So they're in really good shape. Um, this nine games is going to tell us a lot. They very well could have this thing wrapped up by then. If not, it really helps our cause that Minnesota and Chicago are going to be duking it out. Well, we're, we got six against the Royals at home. Yep, this is where, you know, having Terry Francona on that dog out, <laughs> having Sandy Alomar, uh, Willis on that, on the staff, that's been through this. It's, it's going to be key. Like I said, the lack of an ex the lack of experience that we have of having veterans in the dugout. Um, that's why we're going to really rely on our coaching staff uh, to get through this part. Yeah. I, I know, yeah. I know players play and coaches coach, but we're, you know, the, the mental side of the game, we definitely, we're going to definitely need their help. Yeah. It's been a fun week here. This has been a blast to talk about. Let's hope they continue to carry this on through these next nine games and kind of wrap this thing up to get some of the boys some rest. But we got 21 games remaining and only one one day off. So the boys are going to be out there grinding. Um, any of you who are able, make, make sure you get down to the ballpark. They got the the Twins Tito Flex deal. Get two games, $25. Uh, for this weekend, try and get down to the ballpark to support the guys. Um, but until then, thank you all for listening. Make sure you check out BelieveLandMediaLLC.com uh, for all our written content and podcasts about all things Cleveland sports. Make sure you give the podcast a follow at, at Guardians OTCLE. Um, and then James at the Fritz 330. And mine is at underscore mellow, mellow underscore NIE 91. We want to thank all you guys for listening. Let's continue to cheer on these Guardiac kids. That's right. Let's show up and let's support our team. Let's show up, show out, and let's go, go Guardians. Have a good weekend, everybody. See ya.